Hello and welcome to our devotions for today for Wednesday the 20th of May. We're using this booklet, Word 1 to 1, Book 2, and we're looking at John's Gospel. Yesterday, Nigel looked at the late night visit of that Pharisee Nicodemus to Jesus. He, that teacher of Israel, knew nothing of the new birth, about being born again. He didn't realise that the only way to eternal life is through the washing away of our sins by God, that new birth. Nicodemus, the great theologian, did not believe that Jesus had come from God. What will Jesus say in reply to that? Well, we'll look at his answer today, but first of all, let's pray. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, dear Lord, set our hearts on fire with love for you. Teach us your word so that we might faithfully follow you. In the name of the one who died and rose again for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, I'm reading from John chapter 3, verses 12 to 15, and from the New International Version of the Bible. Jesus says to Nicodemus, I have spoken to you of earthly things and you did not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Well, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with a very well-known quote by that author, C.S. Lewis. But I think it's particularly appropriate for us to hear it again today in relation to John chapter 3. Lewis said, A man who is merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit on him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open for us. He did not intend to. Jesus rebukes Nicodemus, not because he doesn't understand what Jesus was saying about new birth, but he, that he refuses to believe Jesus' word about what has, God has to do in every person's life, including religious leaders like Nicodemus. Jesus cannot tell him about the heavenly things, that is, the things to come in the new creation, until he has come to believe the basics of entry into the kingdom of God. There is no entry without rebirth. What Jesus says next to Nicodemus about himself was jaw-droppingly unique. Firstly, Jesus claims to have come from heaven and that he will go back there. He is not a great teacher, another rabbi, but rather the unique son who has come right from the throne room of God in heaven. He is Emmanuel, God with us. In fact, God right in front of Nicodemus that night. What a claim. But as Lewis and other people have noted, no other assessment of Jesus will do. John back in chapter one said that Jesus, the eternal word, had come from the Father full of grace and truth. The glory of God, you see, is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. What a claim that a human being should describe himself in terms of the invisible God. But that is who this Son of Man is. That staggering claim is followed up by Jesus teaching Nicodemus his Bible. Jesus refers to an incident in the wilderness where the people of God had disobeyed God and brought judgment on themselves. In Numbers 21, the Hebrews are attacked by a plague of venomous snakes and many of them die. However, when the people plead with Moses to be rescued, the Lord hears them 
and he commands Moses to make a bronze snake and put it on a pole lifted above the people. Anyone who was bitten was to look at the snake and they would live. It was only a short incident in that long period of wandering for 40 years by God's people. But Jesus spotlights it here to teach its fulfillment now in his coming. The point is that just as the people of God in the Old Testament were to believe God's promise, look to the snake and be saved, so it is that the Son of Man who had come from God would be lifted up and everyone who believes in him would have eternal life. Jesus is referring, in fact, to what is going to come. That is when he is lifted up, that glorious moment when he's lifted up in his crucifixion, it literally lifted up on the cross. Rather than looking at a snake and being physically saved from death, looking to Jesus who dies on the cross, rescues people from hell and gives them eternal life. But notice, please, that looking to the Son means believing in him. He is the only source of eternal life for all who turn to him. He is the only one who can give eternal life, for there is no other name under heaven by which people must be saved except the name of Jesus. We're not told about Nicodemus again for a long way in this Gospel of John. However, it certainly appears that Nicodemus did listen to Jesus' words and he did come to saving faith in him. Jesus is the gateway to heaven, to the kingdom of God, to eternal life. So have you come to that point in your life when you know that Jesus died for you, that he was lifted up on the cross to die in your place and mine for our sins? As that wonderful children's hymn for Easter goes, there was no other good enough to pay the price for sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. Without Jesus, there is no entry into, king, into the kingdom, into eternal life. But I hope that you know with that songwriter that he has indeed unlocked the gate to let us in, to be able to say, yes, I know, Jesus died for me, to know that today with assurance. Well, let's pray, shall we? Lord Jesus, we thank you for revealing to Nicodemus the way to eternal life through saving faith in you. Thank you that in love you made that journey from heaven to earth to the cross to be our saviour. Thank you for the assurance that you have done everything necessary for us to know that all who believe in you today, right now, have eternal life. What a promise, what a comfort, what a saviour you are. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. And let's pray for this nation of Australia and other nations of the world in the midst of this COVID-19 crisis. God of the nations, we pray for Australia and other nations inspire and direct all our leaders at this time, and especially for us in this country, our Prime Minister Scott Morrison, our Premier Gladys Berejiklian, and the National Cabinet, that they may make wise and well-informed decisions for the good of all people. May they have the courage to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, that we may live at peace and in safety. Enable them to have a heart for those who are most vulnerable, most needy in our country, but to work for the good of all. Protect them from corruption, from the temptation to serve themselves. Help us to support and obey those in authority over us as we obey their instructions for the common good, that our nation may be a secure home for all our people. For we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me in my kitchen for this devotion today. If there's any way that we can be of help to you, please don't hesitate to contact us. You can do so 
by going to our website, www.swiz.org.au, where you'll find not only more information about our devotions, but our Sunday services and other resources. Or please feel free to email or contact us by phone too. Well, as we close this morning's devotions, I think it's appropriate that we do so in the words of the ironic blessing that comes from Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace today and always. Amen.